Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation uh, to give this series of lectures and thank you to the organizers for putting on this amazing program. I mean, there are some amazing talks and it's so extensive, like three weeks. It's almost an overload of information, but yeah, it's very great. So what I want to do is um, I want to talk about crystal bases. And um, I mostly work with crystal bases in the context of representation theory and combinatorics. But of course, crystal bases originated in statistical mechanics or solvable lattice models. So that's uh, one of the connections to, to, the, to the workshop. And uh, here I have given you like a, a brief outline of what I want to do in the, in the three lectures. So today I will mostly focus on giving you like a very brief introduction to crystal bases. And then I want to give you two applications. Uh, one is like the Littlewood Richardson rule that many of you might know, but then in terms of crystal bases. And then the, the other one is an application to symmetric functions. So you can use crystal bases um, to find in certain circumstances, you can use them to find uh, extend, uh, expansions into sure functions, for example. And then in the second lecture, um, I actually want to consider some invariant theory. Um, and to do that, uh, we are going to use what are called virtual crystals. So I'm, I'm going to introduce what I mean by that. And then the promotion operator, um, which some of you might know on Tableau, but you can actually also define them on, on crystal bases or tensor products of crystal bases. And then we use that to, to look at an application, uh, which is a cyclic sieving phenomenon. And then in lecture three, uh, we, we go away a little bit from crystal bases and we will look at diagram algebras, insertion algorithms, and, and plethysms. So that's sort of the plan. Um, so let me begin by telling you a little bit where uh, crystal bases came from. So quantum universal enveloping algebras were int introduced by Drinfeld and Jimbo around 1985 um, in order to explain trigonometric R matrices and two-dimensional solvable lattice models. And then around 1990, uh, both Kashivara and Lustig um, looked at these universal quantum universal enveloping algebras, um, also sometimes known as UQ of G, and they looked at certain limits as Q goes to zero. And Q goes to zero in the physical term also corresponds to taking the temperature to zero. So that's why uh, I guess the name crystals, uh, that's where the name crystal sort of comes from because that's sort of like crystallizing. And so what they did is they actually studied the representations of these quantum groups, and then they took the limit and they noticed that um, you can actually uh, study these in terms of very combinatorial, using very combinatorial rules. So basically, what you can think of crystals, like in, in the general sense, are as combinatorial skeletons of representation theory. And one particular question that often comes up in representation theory is, well, so if you have an irreducible representation, uh, let's say V lambda, so indexed by some dominant weight lambda, and then you tensor it with some other irreducible representation V mu, if you want to um, decompose that again in terms of irreducibles, then um, you can ask how often does a particular irreducible appear? So these coefficients C lambda mu nu in type A are also called Littlewood Richardson coefficients. So people are interested in how often does a particular irreducible appear? And then are there sort of combinatorial formulas for, for these numbers? And that's one of the applications that I want to talk about at the end. Okay. And um so even though crystals uh, sort of came from the representation theory of UQG, you can actually introduce them purely combinatorially, so without any reference to UQ of G. And if you do that, um, then you can actually, you can do that by 
introducing what are called Stembridge crystals. So Stembridge introduced certain local rules on graphs, and these local rules actually sort of specify um, crystal graphs that come from representations. So in that way, you can um, introduce them purely combinatorially. And then, so, but the Stembridge crystals only work for simply lace types. And then if you want to do it uh, for also non-simply lace types, you will have to use at virtual crystals. And as I said, that's one thing that we are going to look at tomorrow. Okay, so uh, crystal bases have applications in a lot of different areas. So one of them are symmetric functions, which we will see today. They also appear in number theory, like Whittaker functions. I already mentioned representation theory, and of course they um, originated from exactly solvable lattice models. And then last week we saw a couple of talks about box ball systems. So they they also appear when you study box ball systems. Uh, there are many references for crystal bases, uh, in particular the papers by Kashiwara uh, and so on. And there's also a book by Hong and Kang. But here I just want to give you um, like one reference that uh, you can actually look at in connection with this talk. So I wrote a book with uh, Dan Bump on crystal bases, which which is called crystal bases representation theory and combinatorics. Um, and then if you want to play around with crystals yourself, they actually implement it in Sage. And uh, Dan Bump and I also wrote a, a tutorial in Sage on how to use crystals in Sage. So if you get hooked and you want to play around with them, then that's my, my recommendation where, where you should look at. And by the way, I should say, if you have any questions, please just interrupt me and ask, um, otherwise I'll just keep talking. <laughs> okay, so now uh, let me start by telling you what Kashivara crystals are. Um, so Kashivara crystals, they're indexed by a root system, which I'm going to call phi. And the root system usually has attached to it also an index set. Sorry, this should be set. Uh, an index set, um, which indexes the, the simple roots. And then um, you should also choose a weight lattice, which I call lambda. And then a Kashivara crystal um, of, of this type phi, so uh, related to this root system, is a non-empty set B. So we usually call B the crystals, the crystal. But then you also have certain maps. Um, so you have a, a map EI and FI. These go from the set B, so from the crystal elements to itself. But the the element the the E and F can also annihilate um, certain elements. So that's why here we have union empty. So if EI or FI map a certain B to empty, that would really mean that that state is annihilated by E and F. And you can think of the E and F as a raising and lowering operator in terms of representation theory. You also have these maps epsilon and phi. And for this talk, actually, it suffices to think of the epsilon and phi as, um, so if you are at a given element B, how often can you apply an EI? So that would be counted by the epsilon I, or how often can I apply an Fi and that would be counted by the Fi. I. But there are some settings that Kashivara um, considered where um, you can actually think of this in slightly more general terms. But for this talk, this is what you should think of these epsilons and Fi's. And then there's also a weight map, which um, associates to every element in B, an element in, in, the, in the weight lattice. Okay, and so these maps should satisfy certain conditions, which I've listed here. Um, so the first condition, which I called A1, is that EI and FI are basically um, partial inverses of each other. So if uh, EI on an element X gives you Y, and now X and Y are not empty, so they're really inside the set, 
then um, fi on y should be x. So they are partial inverses. And by partial, I mean, so this does not hold if EI or FI annihilate a particular state. So this only holds when they don't annihilate the state. And then the next condition is that um, if so, if uh, you get Y from X by acting with an EI, then the weight should actually change by a simple root. So by alpha I, I denote the simple root of the corresponding root system. And similarly, so I, I mentioned before that you should think of the epsilon and phi as counting how often you can apply an E or an F. So obviously, if you apply an E to an X, then um, if you think about it this way, then epsilon I on Y should be one less than um, epsilon I on X. And similarly for, for the phi. You can also, so this is condition A2, you can also- Sorry, can I ask a question? Why did you include minus infinity in the definition of the action of yeah, um, so epsilon there, to phi? Yeah, there are certain cases which won't come up in this talk, but um, there, there are certain cases that Kashivara considered where you can, where the phi and epsilon are slightly more general, and then you actually can also assign the, the value minus infinity, but perhaps for this talk, you, you don't really need to consider that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, perhaps for this talk, just uh, let's not consider that case actually. Um, and then, so the phi and the epsilon are actually also related by the weight. So there's this relation that um, uh, phi i minus epsilon i is equal to the weight of x if you pair it with a, with a, a co-root alpha i check. Okay, and so this is really the, the remark that I mentioned before. So, and this is what we are going to consider in this talk. So the phi i really counts. How often can you apply an f i uh, without annihilating it? Um, and the the epsilon i counts. How often um, you you can apply an e i without anni without annihilating it? And uh, in this setting, so if if this is the case, and this is the case for this talk, uh, then we call b semi normal. So. In this talk, I will only be considering semi-normal crystals. Uh, for uh, someone completely unfamiliar, what is, uh, I mean, B, you've just said it's just any set. You haven't said anything else about it. Yes. Is it, is it a finite set? Is it uh, infinite um, set? It, it, is, so for uh, again, for this talk, there will be uh, finite sets. But uh, if you, for example, look at crystals for, uh, Verma modules, they can also be infinite sets. So they're also infinite dimensional crystals. It would help if you could maybe give one simple example. Yeah, yeah. I, the, here, I will give you examples. Here, here, I'm actually giving you two examples, and then we will look at a lot more examples later on. Um, but here will be two finite crystals, so very, very simple crystals. And then we will actually use tensor products to make more complicated examples out of these. Uh, but so this first example, you can think of as um, a crystal um, associated to the vector representation of type A n minus one. So for me now, phi is the root system of type A n minus one. So in this case, the root system consists of the vectors um, so I need to distinguish between the raising operator and the vector. So that's why I put little vectors on top. Uh, so EI minus EJ, when I is not equal to J, so um, they will live in uh, Z to the N. And the simple roots in this case are just differences like this um, of consecutive numbers. So EI minus EI plus one. Our index set is uh, the numbers from one up to n minus one. So in this case, so we have um, these crystal operators, the raising and lowering operators, EI and FI from one up to n minus one. Now, I defined the crystal as a non-empty set, and I'm now 
basically giving you a graph describing the crystal, but the non-empty set are uh, these just boxes, okay? So you can think of them as young tableau was just a single box, and that's why they- Hello. Yes? Hello? Hello, Hello Angela. Yes. Hello, Lux? Hello, Is this a question? Okay, so the, the set B in this case are um, just these single boxes. Um, and they are labeled one, two, three, up to N. And then um, uh, the, the, the FI operators are basically denoted by these arrows between the boxes. So an F1 operator uh, maps one to two, and an F2 operator maps two to three, and so on. Okay, so um, in this case, when I don't draw an arrow labeled by, by something, then that just means that the corresponding F operator actually annihilates um, that particular uh, element in the crystal. So for example, if we look at this one, there's no two arrow coming out, right? There's no two arrow coming out. So that really means that F2 annihilates this element one. And then remember, we also had the weight map, right? We So I need to tell you what the weight of a crystal element is. And the weight of a box labeled I is just equal to EI, okay? And we can quickly check that uh, this weight function actually satisfies this, uh, this condition that I had that an fi changes the, the weight by minus alpha i, where alpha i was a simple root. So the weight of one is equal to e1. The weight of two is equal to e2. And you can see that the difference of the two is precisely minus alpha one, right? So, um, so that, that fits. So this would be um, basically the crystal of type A um, associated with um, uh, the the vector representation. So sometimes I'm also going to call this B box because um, it corresponds to the vector representation. And then here I have another example. This would be a crystal of type C. So in this case, the elements are um, one, two, up to N, so similar to type A. But then I also have boxes labeled by bar letters, n bar, and so on, up to two bar, one bar. Okay, so, and in this case, the, the roots are uh, plus minus, oh, sorry, I should, uh, I should have made vectors here again. Um, plus minus EI uh, and EJ, but then um, for the long root, you also have um, two times EI. The simple roots in this case are uh, similar to type A, uh, EI minus EI plus one, when I is strictly less than N, and then alpha N is two times uh, EN, okay? And uh, the weight letters in this case is again uh, Z to the N. And in this case, I'm going to assign the weight EI to a box labeled I and minus EI to a box labeled I bar. And we can uh, check again that this weight condition is satisfied. So for these ones, it's exactly the same as for type A, but now let us check, for example, N. N has weight um, EN, right, by this condition, but then an FN takes N to N bar, and n bar has weight minus en, and that is exactly, so the difference between the two is precisely minus two en, which is precisely minus the, the simple root alpha n. So that's why the conditions that I had on the previous slide are all satisfied. Any questions so far? Okay, so these are some, some really simple examples, and one of the most powerful properties of crystals is that they 
actually um, are well behaved with uh, respect to taking tensor products. So here are the tensor product rules for crystals. Um, and this is also the reason why then we can start taking tensor products of crystals and we can actually uh, look at this question that I mentioned before of the Littlewood Richardson rule, where you take tensor products and you're trying to decompose them again. So here I'm going to take two crystals, B and C, and they should be associated to the same root system, phi. And we are now going to define the tensor product of, of these two crystals. So as a set, um, this is just the Cartesian product of the sets. Okay, so you just take tuples where the first entry is in B and the second entry is in C. Then I need to tell you what the, the weight is doing. So the weight is just additive. If I take the weight of a tensor product, that's just the sum of the weights. And then I also need to tell you how the raising and lowering operators work. So I need to tell you what Fi is on a tensor product and what Ei is on a tensor product. And this might look a little bit complicated, but what is um, important is that Fi either acts on the first factor and leaves the second factor alone, or it acts on the second factor and leaves the first factor alone. And whether you act on the first or second factor just depends on these phi's and epsilons. Okay. And um, I'm going to, on the next slide, I'm going to give you a very combinatorial way of thinking about these conditions. And the same for the E, okay? Again, it either acts on the left or it acts on the right. Uh, instead of sort of memorizing these complicated conditions, I'm now going to give you a very simple rule of how you can determine whether you act on the left or the right. And this is also called the signature rule. So for um, a tensor product of B tensor C, what you do is you write phi I of B minus signs, or you can also think of them as open brackets, and then uh, epsilon I pluses, and then the same for the C, okay? And then what you do, if you think of the pluses as uh, open brackets and the minuses as closed brackets, Basically, what you're now going to do is you're going to just match brackets. So you're successively going to bracket whenever you see a plus before a minus, you're sort of pairing these up. Okay. And those paired, uh, paired pluses and minuses, you sort of uh, you ignore. And then the fi acts on the rightmost unbracketed minus and the EI acts on the leftmost unbracketed plus. So in particular, if you have more minuses here than pluses here, that means that the FI will act on this factor. So that means if epsilon I of B is smaller than phi I of B, then you will act on the C. And if you compare here, this is exactly this, this case that I've mentioned here. So this is a way of, this is a very combinatorial way of how you can um, understand this, this tensor product rule on crystals. And the amazing thing is that this tensor product rule on crystals really captures the representation theory of the underlying Lie algebra. Um, and here I'm going to give you an example of, of how you can actually um, do this for this very simple crystal that we looked at before, namely the crystal of type A2. So remember the crystal of uh, type A2 just had a one going to a two with an F1 operator, then going to a three with an F2 operator. So now what we are doing here is we are just going to take the tensor product of B box, tensor B box um, for type A2. Okay, so as a set, the elements are just tuples. So, or I write them here as tensor products. Um, and so here is one particular element, one tensor one. And then using the signature rule, it's very easy to de determine that 
if I act with an F1 operator on this, this will just make this one into a two. If I act again with an F1 operator, this will make this one into a two. So that gives us this string. But on this element here, I can also act with an F2 to make this into a one three and so on and so on. So here we get one particular connected component. Um, and one thing that you can observe is that we can actually characterize this component or the elements in this component by saying that um, the first element is always less or equal to the second element, right? So if I look at these sort of in this way, the words are always weakly increasing. And also notice that the weight of this top element here, so this is also called a highest weight vector. Um, this highest weight vector has weight uh, 2e1, or if I write this as a partition, this would just be a box, uh, uh, two boxes next to each other. So this would actually correspond to the partition two. Oh, there are more elements if you look at uh, just the Cartesian product of one, two, threes. And um, what is not in here are the ones where the elements are actually strictly decreasing. So here I, I have the element two, one, right? Two, one is nowhere seen in, in this component. Um, and then you can, again, use the signature rule to see that if I act with an F2 on this, it, may, it makes this two into a three. So that's what this F2 operator is doing. And then with an F1, you can go from this element to this element. And again, so this one here would be called a highest weight element because there's no uh, arrow coming into this. And the weight of this would be E1 plus E2 right, because we have one, two, and one, one. And if I write this as a partition, this would correspond to the partition one, one. So a, a single column. Okay, so um, the tensor product rule actually gives you also the ability to make more complicated crystals out of these very simple crystals that we uh, encountered before. Uh, any questions so far? So then, the next things that I want to talk about are applications of these crystals. So my first application would be um, the Littlewood-Richardson rule. Um, this was done by Littleman, Kashiwara Nakashima, and also Stembridge. And then the second application, if I have time, will be um, to show you how to get true expansions um, using crystals. And the example that I want to do is I want to look at Stanley symmetric functions, and um, I want to give you a crystal uh, associated to the Stanley symmetric functions, and then show you how to how you can actually get a sure expansion of these Stanley symmetric functions using the crystal. And this is based on work with Jennifer Morse. Now I'm going from blackboard to whiteboard, um, and uh, I, I will first talk about the Littlewood Richardson rule. So when we just looked at these simple examples of uh, the tensor product of crystals, um, one thing that you, I hope, saw is that each component, so here we had two components, um, is you can sort of, uh, each component you can look at bijectively with um, the highest weight element. So it's sort of like determined by its highest weight element. And um, this is actually something you would need to prove, but um, if you use this tensor product rule, um, then one thing that, uh, that was proven is that um, these components always look isomorphic if the highest weight element is the same. So basically these components are completely determined by the weight of these highest weight elements. Okay, so that's this first uh, bit of information that I uh, presented here. So the connected components in a crystal and by normal crystal, I now just mean the crystal that actually comes from a representation. 
they are completely determined by the weight of the highest weight vector. Okay, so if you have a connected component, you usually label that then by, by this dominant weight or in type A, it would just be a partition. So if you think back at my very first example, I call it that B box. And the box is really the weight of that crystal. Um, so you can think of that box as just this lambda that's asso associated to, to that crystal. Okay. And so what we are now interested in is we are going to take um, the tensor product of two crystals, uh, one associated with highest weight lambda, the other associated with highest weight mu. And then we want to look at the connected components in that in those crystals and in, in this tensor product. Okay. And um, so if you believe this correspondence, then if you look at the connected components that appear, if I look at the highest weight of each connected component, that would actually give us um, the, the crystals, the irreducible that, that sit inside there. So this is basically the crystal analog of this ver very first motivating example that I gave in the very beginning when I said that you uh, one uh, important question in representation theory is if you look at the tensor product of an irreducible V lambda tends an irreducible V mu, what is the decomposition of this? So this is sort of like the, the crystal analog of this. And these, uh, the multiplicity um, of a given component is also called the, the Littlewood Richardson coefficient. So an important question is what are combinatorial interpretations for these coefficients? And the crystals actually give us a, a very easy answer for this. Um, namely, um, I, if you believe this correspondence that I told you before, that every connected component is uniquely specified by its highest weight vector, then all we need to do is we need to count how many highest weight vectors are there of a given weight? And this is basically what, what this formula is saying. So if you take um, two elements, so if you take a tensor product of elements, B tensor, let's say C, in B lambda, B mu, then you would like to count how many highest weight elements are there. And using the signature rule, it's very easy to check that the right factor actually by itself has to be a highest weight element. So this factor is already determined. It has to be a highest weight element of this crystal B mu. And then there's more freedom for the left factor. So the left, the left element B just has to be um, in B lambda such that the, the tensor product itself is highest weight. So then you would have to check whether it's annihilated by all the EI operators. And then um, if you want to get the component um, B nu, then um, you also need to um, require that the weight of this element is actually equal to nu. So this would be a combinatorial way of um, uh, yeah, giving you a formula for, for these little wood Richardson coefficients. And let me now uh, do that in type A, because in type A, uh, you might be familiar with the way of doing that in terms of Yamanuchi words. So I just want to briefly show you that that's actually equivalent. Um, so in type A, as I already mentioned, the dominant weights, um, can also be associated with partitions. So a dominant weight would be a weight that is a, a positive sum of fundamental weights. So for me, the fundamental weights are these omega sub H. Um, and so an omega sub H and type A is just E1 plus E2 plus dot, dot, dot plus EH. And you can view such a, a WH as a column of height h. So if I have such a positive sum, then 
these subscripts just tell me the columns in the partition. Um, so a partition, um, so for example, Sylvie in her lectures, she already introduced partitions, but a partition of a number is just um, a weekly decreasing sequence such that where all entries are uh, greater or equal to zero, such they add up to the number that you actually want to partition. So for example, this here would be a partition of four plus three plus one, so of eight, um, right? And so this would be a partition of eight, but in terms of these uh, fundamental weights, this would be omega three plus two omega two plus omega one. And uh, so when I when we looked at this example of uh, the tensor product of type A crystals, we already saw that one component had this condition that the elements were weakly increasing, and the other component had the condition that the elements were strictly decreasing. So if you take higher, uh, more power, like bigger tensor products, you will actually see that all the connected components actually you can sort of view them as a semi-standard young tableau of a given shape so in the example that i had before the one highest weight was um, just a two row a one row thing with two boxes and the other one was a, a one column partition with two boxes so in this case, my lambda would be the partition two or one one. And in general, you can actually get all uh, semi-standard young tableau of a given shape that way, right? So in type A, the crystals, are, the elements in the crystal are just the set of all semi-standard young tableau of a given shape. And just as a brief reminder, so, a semi-standard Young tableau, if I give you a shape, so here I've given you the shape 4, 3, 1, then they should be uh, weakly increasing in rows and strictly increasing in columns. So those are the elements of the crystal. And um, the, the Littlewood Richardson tableau, if I translate what I told you before, would just read that um, the Littlewood Richardson coefficient is the set of all elements B tensor U mu, such that if you read your semi-standard Young tableau column wise, so column B, column U mu just means uh, read the word by reading everything column wise, this should be Yamanuchi. And what does Yamanuchi mean? This means that if I read things from right to left, I always have weekly more ones than twos, weekly more twos than threes, and so on and so on. And uh, sometimes this is also known as like the reverse lattice, reverse lattice words at the same as, as Yamanuchi. So here I'm giving you um, two examples. So let's look at the tensor product of these two um, semi-standard Young tableau. Okay, so I read them column wise. So I get three, one, two, two, one, one. And this is this word that I've written here. And this word is Yamanuchi because if you read it from right to left, I always have weekly more ones and twos and weekly more twos and threes. And so the reason why this works is because this is exactly compatible with our signature rule that I mentioned before. Because remember the signature rule said that whenever you see a two before a one, you bracket it, right? And that means, so if you always have weekly more ones than twos, that means that all the twos will be bracketed with a one to the right of it. And that means that the EI operator, the crystal operator annihilates that element. So that's why this condition, this combinatorial condition is exactly what we what we expect from um, the the crystal operators or the the signature rule. Here's another example, um, which is not a Yamanuchi word. So if I if I read this, I get three one three two one one, and this is not Yamanuchi because you can see that here I have 
uh, two threes and only one two to the right of it. So therefore, this is not Yamanuchi. If I think of it <clears throat> in terms of crystals, um, the this three would be bracketed with this two, but then you have like a, a free three, which can be lowered by an E2. And therefore, this is actually not a highest weight element. Questions? So here I'm going to give you one more example of this. Um, here I'm going to take the tensor product of B21 with B2. And here I have listed all the highest weight elements for you. Okay, so as I mentioned before, the right element has to be highest weight by itself. And the highest weight element of a given shape is always the super standard tableau where you put ones in row one, twos in row two, threes in row three, and so on. So you have only one choice. You have to uh, consider the, the semi-standard Young tableau one, one, two. But then you have more choices even if you want to keep it highest weight for the left factor. And my claim is that these are all the choices. Um, so these give you all highest weight elements. Then you can look at the weight of these highest weight elements. So here we have four ones and one two. So the weight would correspond to the partition four one. Here we have three ones and two two. So this would correspond to the weight three two and so on. And therefore our crystal Littlewood Richardson rule says that this tensor product here decomposes into these connected components. And um, if you're familiar with the Pieri rule, this, this exactly corresponds to the Pieri rule because what does the Pieri rule say? So here I'm taking the shape two one and I uh, sort of use the Pieri rule with, with just a two. So that would mean um, I take my shape to one and I add two boxes in such a way that you will get a horizontal strip. So I think Sylvie in her lectures also denoted this by non -interla uh, or interlacing um, partitions. So a horizontal strip is just one where you have um, at most one box in every column. So here you have you can add a, a one one here, or you can add a box here or here or here. And these are all the choices and they precisely correspond to, to these. Okay, so this is um, all I wanted to say about the Littlewood Richardson rule. So just to summarize, um, you can get the Littlewood Richardson rule by looking at the combinatorics of, of crystal bases and the signature rule, and you can get a very nice uh, combinatorial interpretation for, uh, for what appears in, in the decomposition. Uh, any questions so far? Well, this is a little bit out from another direction, but is there any way to relate these crystal bases and uh, so on to fermionic uh, exterior product spaces? Uh, yeah, so there there are also crystals uh, for those cases. Yes, um, they look a little bit different. Um, so they are different models. Um, instead of uh, uh, looking at tableau, you would look at these Maya diagrams that Sylvie also talked about, and you can define um, crystals on in that setting as well. Yes. So they will be they will be multiples of Maya diagrams or sequences of Maya diagrams. Yeah, you uh, uh, one way of looking at them. Yeah, you can look at sequences of Maya diagrams, and then there are also certain uh, rules of how you bracket uh, certain things, uh, and then you can uh, define an E or F operator on these. So uh, I, can, e... I can send you a reference. There are several references for this. Okay. Are the E and F operators in the fermionic view just creation and annihilation operators? Yes. Uh -huh. yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for the questions. So the second application that I want to talk about um, uh, uh, that you can use crystals to get uh, sure expansions of certain symmetric functions. 
And on this slide, I just want to tell you um, uh, sort of like the general method of, of how this would work, okay? So first of all, as we have just seen, if you look at the type A crystal, and here I say Stembridge crystal, just because I want to look at crystals that actually correspond to representations. So if you take a type A crystal, we have seen that one way, one combinatorial model would be to view them as semi-standard Young tableau of a given shape, of a given shape lambda. Then you can define the character of a crystal uh, by just taking the sum over all elements in the crystal. So in this case, it would be the sum over all semi-standard Young tableau, x to the weight. <clears throat> and in this case, um, we are familiar with uh, sure functions. So um, the, this is precisely the definition or one of the definitions of a sure polynomial, right? If you sum over all semi-standard Young tableau. So that's what you get. So in type A, <clears throat> the character of a crystal is precisely a sure polynomial. And the number of variables is precisely related to the rank of my, my algebra. So now suppose that you have a symmetric function, f, um, or symmetric polynomial. And you know that this is given as the sum over some combinatorial object or some combinatorial set C, x to the weight. OK, so this would be a monomial expansion of your sure function. OK, and suppose that you know that this particular symmetric function actually has a positive sure expansion, meaning that you can write this f as a sum of the sure functions, but that the coefficients themselves are all non-negative integer coefficients. So this is what I'm saying here. All the a lambda are non-negative integers. So in general, every symmetric function can be written as a sum of sure functions because sure functions form a basis. But this is special because now we are assuming that the coefficients themselves are non-negative. So if you know that this is true, then uh, one way to find a combinatorial interpretation for these numbers is by putting a crystal structure on the set C, on the set C that underlies this particular symmetric function. And um, this is what I want to demonstrate now in terms of the, the Stanley symmetric function. Um, I realize I don't have a lot of time, so let me uh, basically give you just the definition of the Stanley symmetric functions, tell you what the set C is, and then I will just uh, very briefly tell you that you can put a, a crystal, stru crystal structure on that set, and therefore you can get these coefficients. So let me do that in the in the last five minutes. So how can we define these Stanley symmetric functions? So first of all, um, let's look at the symmetric group. It is generated by simple transpositions, SI. They square to one. They commute when the indices are far apart. And they satisfy the braid relation if um, you have adjacent uh, coefficients. Then every element in the symmetric group can be written as a product of these generators. So a particular W and SN can be written as a product of these simple transpositions. And such a, an expression is called reduced if the number of elements that you use is minimal. And in this case, the, this L, the number of factors that you use is also called the length of, of uh, W. Now what I need is I need to define what are called decreasing factorizations of a W. So if you have a W, we are going to write it as a product of certain pieces, which I call W upper K, W upper K minus one, and so on. Um, and this is called a decreasing factorization. 
Well, first of all, if W is a product of that and it's length preserving, and if every factor itself is a product of S's such that the coefficients are decreasing. Okay, so let me give you a brief example. So here would be a particular permutation. And here I have written it um, as a decreasing factorization. So I have put an, the S2 in a factor, then I put these three together in a factor, and this is decreasing because these numbers three, two, one are decreasing. And then I put this last factor also um, in a factor by itself. And then um, the, the Stanley symmetric function is one way to define it is by saying, so you fix a W and, um, and then you look at all decreasing factorizations um, of this W, and then you take um, X1 to the length of the first factor, X2 to the length of the second factor, and so on and so on. So that is the definition of the Stanley symmetric function. So you so can- the S's are all two cycles? Uh, the, the S's are simple transpositions. Yeah, so, two cycles. Yeah, so an so S. So I don't S understand the notation. Interchange so, two and three. So, sorry, uh, so sorry, which would exchange two and three? Uh, S two interchanges two and three. Oh, it's always S the one, the next one, or what? I yeah. don't quite understand. So S three and uh, exchanges three and one, or what? Uh, so S i interchanges i and i plus one. Yes. So these are these are paths in the Cayley graph generated by by uh, transpositions. Yeah, yeah, you can think of. And that. so these are uh, is this the same thing as what one calls a monotonic path? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, think the monotonic path, you only look at the second element, and they all are either weakly or or uh, strongly increasing or decreasing, whichever you choose. Is that uh, does that amount to the same thing? Uh, I don't think so, but um, yeah, I'm. I, I don't think so. I think this is, but but yeah, you can think of them as paths in the Cayley graph. Yes. Um, anyway, since I'm almost out of time, let me just sort of tell you, uh, sort of the the philosophy of what you can do now. Um, so here we now have a symmetric function that is where we have the monomial expansion of of the symmetric function. And while it's known, uh, I have here more examples, but what is known by Stanley and Edelman Green is that they actually have a positive expansion in terms of sure functions. So one way to get a combinatorial description of these A's is by now imposing a crystal structure on these uh, decreasing factorizations. And um, I'm basically out of time, but uh, what Jennifer Morse and I did is we actually put a crystal structure on the set of decreasing factorizations. And um, I'm not going to give you the details, but I'm going to show you like a nice picture of how this crystal actually looks like. Um, and then um, the, ba the main result that we then therefore get by putting this crystal structure on the set is we get a combinatorial rule for these coefficients, again, as the highest weight vectors in this crystal, such that the weight is precisely the lambda, which gives you the lambda in the shoe expansion. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, and I should also say uh, tomorrow, so if, if you somehow got lost, uh, tomorrow's lecture, will be sort of indie except for knowing what crystal bases are um uh will be sort of independent of of what we talked about today so so can you use crystal to give the short expansion of other symmetric functions uh, yeah i mean that's basically the hope so if you i mean every time i see a symmetric function that has a positive shoe expansion i'm always interested in 
trying to put a crystal structure on the underlying objects and then trying to get the the shoe expansion that way so this in principle there should be a general method yes but then often it's hard to actually find the precise crystal structure is there what, hope to do that for llt polynomials uh, yeah i mean so for llt polynomials um you have this extra uh you have the t right you have the, mm -hmm. the statistic and um I guess, yeah, it, it, if you want to do it for LLT polynomials, you would like to do it in such a way that these connected components that I was describing, that on these connected components, the T statistic is constant. And for LLT polynomials, um, the, the statistic is sort of like a generalized inversion statistic. And usually the crystals, um, they interact better with major index kind of statistics rather than inversion statistics so that's why i think that particular problem is hard but in principle uh i mean it should be possible <laughs> but yeah that's a very good question thank you so so if if you're trying to get the share function decomposition of a particular polynomial and you identified it in terms of this uh set c and you're trying to impose a crystal structure on that then there are presumably many ways to define such a crystal structure so, so so what are the guiding principles to make this work does it have to be a connected crystal structure for example is it unique in that case or uh, so yeah it's not necessarily unique so if you don't have any other constraints like uh, the the example that sylvie just mentioned where you have another statistic if you don't have any other constraints the only guiding principle is that um the the operators that you will define the e's and the f's um they they actually give you a crystal that corresponds to a representation but other than that it doesn't really matter if you have other statistics like a t statistic or a qt statistic then the guiding principle would be that these connected components uh, that the statistic is constant on these connected components but other than that yeah there could be multiple ways of defining it in principle mm -hmm. but c doesn't have to be connected as a crystal oh, oh this, the yeah the the set c itself is usually not connected as a crystal it usually uh corresponds to multiple connected components and each connected component actually corresponds to one of the Schur functions. Ah, okay. Yeah, so it's usually not connected. Okay, thank you. I think John had a question uh, uh, online. Yes, a uh, sort of dull question. The the in the Stenbridge uh, symmetric functions, the sum is over lambdas all of the same weight. What is uh, the constraint on the lambdas? Uh, I'm not sure which lambdas you're, you're talking uh, Well, about. you have your sum A lambda. Uh, I can go back to my slides. Uh, this one? No, no, it, it's the, the Stenbridge symmetric from yeah, ah, the Stanley, Stanley, sorry, Stanley symmetric. Yeah. But uh, no, you had a sum over sure functions and uh, the coefficients. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. uh, I don't know which transparency that. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. the lambda in that sum, this is a finite sum, presumably. Yes. The lambdas are they all of the same weight? Uh, yes. Usually, yes, they're all of the same weight. Uh, no, um, uh, you mean they have the same number of boxes? Yeah. No. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Uh, because I, I, you were talking about positivity, and it reminded me of uh, uh, Grassmannians and positive Grassmannians. Uh, they're the uh, it wouldn't be fixed weight. It would be all. I mean, if lambda is the is the uh, partition, then all partitions that that fit into a given rectangular partition of suitable dimension, and the A's would be positive. Mm -hmm. If you're talking about positive Grassmannians, and the and but they would also satisfy the quadratic relations, which are uh, which which are essentially the Plucker relations, but I guess that has nothing to do with these symmetric functions. Uh, so, 
I guess you can look at affine Stanley symmetric functions, and then they would be related to affine Grassmannians. Um, so in that sense, there's, I guess, a relation. Well, what I'm but thinking guess, of this is, this is maybe from coming from a different perspective, but, but one has this correspondence, you know, with the Maya diagrams and the Schur functions. And uh, so the, the Maya diagrams can be looked at as uh, exterior elements, elements of an exterior algebra. And uh, there's this so-called bose fermi equivalence where you replace the, uh, the exterior basis elements with sure functions. And so this is what, uh, sum over these things is what would be in integrable systems, what we call a tau function. It provided that the coefficients were actually the Plicker coefficients from a uh, Grassman, uh, an element of the Grassmannian. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what is a tau function. Yeah. And then there's a great interest in the positive Grassman, in the positive Grassmannians, where all of these Plicker coefficients, which are all determinants, are positive. So, because you mentioned that you were particularly interested in positive linear combinations of S lambda, that is a situation where that that occurs. And that's quite important in, uh, you know, in the study of solitons and so on. Yeah. Okay. So then, yeah, in that, in that case, I guess, yeah, you could also use crystals to explain the positive shoe expansion. Okay. Uh, any, anybody else? No. Okay. Well, thank you again, Anne.